Well, hello all. I know that some people are still trickling in from lunch, and may I say, it is always a presenter's delight to be able to present at one o'clock, right after you've had a big old lunch. So, uh, you know, do your best to, uh, to keep those eyes open as we do this, but I don't think you're going to have much trouble with that. I am so delighted, so delighted to be able to uh, introduce Moya Peterson. Um, she is a clinical professor at the uh, KU Schools of Nursing and Medicine. She is a family nurse practitioner in the KU Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the Medical Center. I um, met Moya several years ago as uh, I'm the former um, transition program manager. I retired last year. When I um, was learning about and trying to build the program here um, with the staff, um, I heard from another doctor about, uh, about Moya and um, her incredible clinic serving those with Down syndrome and how many of our young adult patients had transitioned under her care. And she was gracious enough to let me go um, watch and, and see and understand what she's doing. Um, for those of you who have started that journey of uh, transferring care um, to certain clinics, it's very rare that you find, unfortunately, it's very rare that you find uh, providers that are really passionate about helping you um, come into their clinic and learn that very different move from pediatric to adult care. And Moya is, is one of those uh, wonderful profession, uh, professionals. She established the clinic for adults with Down syndrome, and it is the only one in the country that is staffed and administered by a nurse practitioner. Um, it's also one of the very few in the Midwest that offers care to adults with Down syndrome. She was invited to be on a committee of providers that developed the Global Down Syndrome Foundation's medical care guidelines for adults with Down syndrome. She's passionate about it. She um, works tirelessly. I have seen her go to bat for many, many patients um, to make sure that they had exactly what they need. And it's just the kind of doc that you want to have caring for you and, and your kiddos. Um, before um, she comes on, I forgot I was going to start with just a reminder uh, about the, um, the um, exhibitors um, and the registration that you have to uh, for the raffle that will be at the end of the, of the sessions today. Um, it's the, you probably saw them outside where the exhibitors are in room one uh, on the first floor. Um, uh, just please make sure that you turn in that ticket so that you're eligible um, for the, the raffle at the end of that. So, Moya, oh yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And it's uh, nice to be here today talking about transitioning, which I know is a, a very difficult time period, not only in your, your kiddo's life, but in your life. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, when I was a senior in college, <clears throat> I met a young man that had Down syndrome in a day services program that I had a clinical rotation at. Um, and I have done my very best at trying to remember if I had ever met anybody with a disability or uh, whether it be physical or developmental, either way, and um, in my town. Um, even with Down syndrome, it happens once in about 800 births. So I lived in a town of 6,000. So I have to believe that there was people there that had Down syndrome, but I can't remember ever seeing one because they weren't allowed kind of out in the public when I was growing up. So they were, they were really kept apart from the neurotypical populations. Um, in those days, if you had a baby with a disability of any kind, most often the advice was to put them in a, some kind of institution and not take them home uh, because it would cause problems for your family and it would be hard. And so um, I always keep in mind that the families that I see now with, with kids with disabilities that are 40 or 50, um, they've had to fight for everything their kids had everything that their kids have gotten they've had to fight for, whether that's going to school or in church activities or in recreational activities, they've had to fight for everything. And in particular, they've had to fight for services. So I try to keep in mind that 
Um, these parents um, have been very, very involved in their child's care and they fought for everything. And so um, for them to make a change is, is incredibly important. So I finished my um, PhD in 2006 and in 2009 I started uh, the Down Syndrome Specialty Clinic. And um, <clears throat> it became readily apparent to me that there weren't many healthcare providers that either could or would be willing to see um, adults with special needs. And uh, my name got out very quickly um, that I would be willing to, to see um, anybody with special needs. Um, the scheduling department always calls me and said, you know, this mom's called and her daughter has special needs, would you be willing? And I, I always write back and say I would never turn away an adult with special needs. Um, and so, but I think there's, there's a lot of reasons that, that providers um, have this reluctance to see uh, an adult with, with um, special needs. Sometimes it's just a lack of knowledge. Um, there are so many syndromes that you can't know about all of them. And even with one as, as incredibly frequently as we see Down syndrome, very few providers know how to take care of an adult with Down syndrome because it's changed. And so there's, there's a lack of knowledge. Um, we all recognize that it takes a bit more time. Uh, any of you that have been to see your provider know they try to get you in and out in 15 or 20 minutes. And that's just not gonna happen when you have an adult with a special need. And then sometimes insurance issues are, are prevalent and they have to, so they have to consider that. So there's lots of reasons that, that people will uh, prefer not to see an adult with special needs. But um, I, I just can't, I can't do that. I have to see them. So um, I always agree and, uh, and want, to, to want to try to help. So I started the clinic in, in 2009 and I've learned a lot some through just pure trial and error, uh, some through reading and consultation with colleagues across the country. Um, as um, Terry said, we've got the only clinic for adults with Down syndrome between Chicago and Denver. And I'm in the only clinic run by an NP. Um, and I'm active in some professional groups and I was really pleased to be on the national committee that uh, developed healthcare guidelines for the adults with Down syndrome it was the first ever of its kind and uh, we're, we're working again on the next iteration of that. Here's a picture of that and it was published in the uh, Journal of American Medical Association and I suspect they didn't look at the authorship because if they'd have seen my name they probably wouldn't have published it. <coughs> nurses, nurses um, are not held in high esteem by the American Medical Association, uh, especially nurse practitioners. <coughs> So um, today in my clinic, I've seen hundreds, hundreds of adults with Down syndrome, and, but I've also seen uh, a, a fair number of patients with autism, uh, other chromosomal abnormalities, some unique syndromes that I have to look up um, when I see them coming, and some with developmental delay for, at this moment, we don't know why. Um, sometimes it's because of an accident. You know, I've got uh, one gentleman that dove off a dock when he was 16, and. Uh, had spinal cord injury and uh, has had developmental delay from that. Some, um, I see one adult that was a shaken baby and so she was, she's the way she is because of some abuse that occurred. And it does take extra time. And as you all know, uh, when you go to a provider's office, you, you usually have a sheaf of paperwork to go, to go with you. Um, I usually have to fill out paperwork two or three times um, at the same visit, and many times it's the same set. Um, I have to fill out one for the day services and one for the group home and one for Special Olympics and then, <laughs> and then mine that I have to do. And so it, um, it, is, it is time consuming and it, is, it does seem repetitive, but that's, um, that's kind of the nature of the beast that we deal with these days. Um, and then also if, if your adult is in residential care at the time, I have several layers of folks that I have to attend to. I have the direct caregivers, um, I have uh, people that are supervisors of the direct caregivers, I have parents, um, and then there's sometimes uh, committees and, and people above that that I don't necessarily see, but sometimes I'll have to answer. Um, I think what makes me so frustrated with that is sometimes they can't tell me what's going on. Um, you know, the, um, sometimes, uh, 
I had one, one person come in and I said, well, what are you here today? And the caregiver said, I don't know, they just told me to bring her. And it wasn't particularly helpful um, in dealing with her. Um, and so uh, we had to go a different route and I had to FaceTime somebody. And so it, it, um, you have to be creative sometimes. Um, probably one of the hardest things and I think one of the reasons that a lot of providers um, have trouble with this group is they can't tell you what's going on and you all know that better than I do. Um, maybe you just know that they're in pain but they can't tell you where. Um, you know, I had one guy that the staff would call me and they said he's whacking his head again on the wall and it was always because he had a urinary tract infection. And so um, that was, became our first rule out but it took us a while to develop that knowledge that when he did that particular behavior that was the, the issue. But sometimes the behavior doesn't match up real well with what's going on and they can't tell you, they can't tell you. And so you have to base it on, um, on somebody else's reports or just what you think is going on. I've told a lot of people if I could uh, get frequent flyer miles for the seat of my pants, I'd be really good because I fly by them a lot. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you some things that I think you all know. The school system is responsible um, for the kids until they're 18 and then the kids have the option of whether to con continue in a, in a bridge type program and uh, many times you're involved with the school system long before that through um, pre-K and preschool and infant stimulation programs. And then the federal mandate says that they have to offer something to special needs adults after 18 until they're 21. But that's optional. If, you're, if your adult doesn't want to do that, they don't have to. But at 21, this crisis occurs and the school system's done. And several things happen. The, um, the, the pediatricians or all the pediatric people that you see said you really need to start looking for an alternative now. 21 is about as far as, as far as they are able to go. And for some of you, the, your adult doesn't want to be seen at the pediatrician's office anymore. It's full of little kids and little chairs and little toys and they feel like they're an adult and they don't want to be seen there anymore. And so um, you have to look for a provider alternative. And so um, not only have you lost your routine healthcare provider, but now you've lost every specialist that had pediatric whatever in front of their name. Pediatric neurology, pediatric cardiology, et cetera, et cetera. So you've lost all of those providers as well. Um, the wait list for some of the services and for residential care can be up to eight years. And some of you may know that it's longer than that. Um, and, and you have to be uh, be sure that you have the insurances, you know, the Medicaid, Medicare business all has to be balanced out. Um, I just recently had a young man that had never applied for Medicaid and his folks grew older and said we really need residential care. He was having some dementia issues. They needed somebody to help him and we couldn't get him into a group home even if we found one because he hadn't ever applied for Medicaid. And so it was, uh, we had to do a lot of uh, preliminary legwork before we could even get him um, to become eligible. Um, jobs are hard to find. Job coaches are harder to find um, if, you're, if your adult wants to work. And so um, I also know that jobs are, are really optional for um, according to the manager of the store. And if the manager wants to hire somebody with special needs, the, the store will say fine. But if the manager doesn't want to, um, there's nothing that makes them have to do that. So I always feel like that at 21, it, it feels like the parents are on their own. They're kind of just shoved off the end of the cliff there and you have to figure this all out. Um, some of you may or may not know who your caseworker is when your child turns 21. You know, I think things have gone along pretty well and schools, you know, you've got your IEP, you've got all of these things in place. The school's got transportation, picks your child up in the morning, takes them to school, brings your child home. Um, there's a few social activities maybe that your child's involved in um, and things have gone along pretty well. And then all of a sudden school's done, transportation's done, your, your caregivers are done and you've, you've really lost contact with your, your caseworker and that um, then pr presents problems. Um, you can't find somebody to take over health care. You don't know where the specialists are. You don't have any activities, you don't have any transportation. 
Uh, maybe you've got a, a kiddo that would like to have a job and you're, tr you're trying to find that and put that together. Um, maybe uh, for some of my folks, the parents are aging and they need assistance. Um, they've taken care of their child now for 40 or 50 years and they need some assistance to help take care of them. Um, guardianship, which I think you had a, a already had um, a, comp, a talk on today, uh, is a huge issue. It's expensive. Um, I have no evidence for what I'm going to say now, but I think it's harder on moms than it is dads um, because all of a sudden a court has to tell a mom whether or not she's capable of taking care of her child. <laughs> and moms say, I've taken care of him for all these years. What do you mean they have to tell me whether or not I'm capable? Yes, that's kind of what it feels like sometimes because I have to fill out paperwork saying that this individual is capable of, of taking care of, of and being the guardian of this child. So this is a huge thing. It's a, it feels like, I've, I've talked to parents and it feels like they said they step off the edge of a cliff into a, a darkness and they don't know where they're going. Um, there are many specialty clinics here, especially at Children's Mercy, um, that are designed to deal with kids that have very unique issues. And um, it's important work and it's, um, it's, they do excellent work here. But now, um, as in Down syndrome, these children are living into adulthood. Um, 10, 15, 20 years ago, these kids didn't live outside the pediatrician's purview. They, they passed away because of some kind of health issue, maybe a heart issue or pneumonia or whatever, and they didn't live outside the pediatrician's um, purview, but now they do. And so because of that, there's so few providers that are informed. Um, they're not nearly as informed about some of these issues as the pediatric providers. And so it becomes a major task to find an adult provider um, that is willing to care for an adult with a disabling condition. So I think you need to know what a provider asks themselves. So when somebody calls and says, I have a child or a dependent that has this, whether some, I have a lot of brothers and sisters that take care of their siblings, um, and would you take them on? Um, and so they have to think about what is this syndrome or this disability and, and what systems does it involve? I mean, what, what problems are they going to have? Are they verbal? Or are they nonverbal? Um, are they developmentally delayed? Uh, what kind of health care issues does this syndrome produce? And what kind of health care issues is this particular individual experiencing? What do I have to monitor? What tests do I need to run? What do I need to watch for? Uh, what screenings should I do? Um, especially with my guys with Down syndrome, they don't need all the adult screenings that we do for the neurotypical population. Um, a, they create issues that, I, that the risk is worse than the benefit, and B, they just don't have some of the diseases that we screen neurotypical people for, and so they don't need some of those screenings. What other specialists am I gonna have to get involved? You know, do I need, do they have seizures? Well, I need to have a neurologist. Do they have GI issues? Well, I need to get GI involved. And then can I, bottom line, can I effectively care for this patient and effectively take care of what he needs, he or she needs? So these next slides are just kind of random thoughts that I had. Um, there's kind of no, not necessarily in a lot of organization um, I was telling Terry, I worked here at Children's Mercy the first three years I was a nurse, which is now the dark ages. And um, my head nurse at the time told me if I ever got organized, I was going to be a darn fine nurse. And I'm still waiting. Um, and that was in 1976. So <laughs> I'm thinking any day now before I retire, um, I might get organized. But anyway, you will see from these slides probably uh, why she said that. Um, my advice to you is don't wait till your pediatric provider says this is the last visit. I can't see your child again. Um, start looking early for who else might be uh, a provider and that could provide your child with, with care. Um, so it isn't such an abrupt, um, an abrupt transition. And make a visit or two before you give up your pediatric care provider. Go to the clinic and see how they do and how they interact with your, your kiddo. It may not be, um, he, they may not be your first choice. He, you may need to look again. And so try to, and it, it's always easier to make that transition if the kiddo knows where they're going. Um, make sure, um, as we talked about, there's guardianship or DPOA in place. 
the age of 18. Um, most providers will go ahead and, and talk to you, even though your child is 19 or 20, um, and give you the information, but legally, they're not supposed to. And even though you're the parent, once they turn 18 legally, uh, we should not be uh, releasing information to you unless you are the guardian of the DPOA. And for me, I've had parents say, no, I don't want to take, take away their ability to make decisions. And for me, I don't, that doesn't take away from your child's ability to make decisions, but it gives them a safety net um, so that they can, they can make their decision and you can be sure that it's, it's the appropriate decision. But also, if they have some kind of emergency, um, you're there to be able to sign the informed consent and whatever has to be signed. So I, I, to me, it just gives them a, a safety net to have a, uh, some kind of DPOA or guardian. Be aware that the model is going to be different. Um, I think for a lot of your clinics here, you have a multidisciplinary team that comes, um, and you come, and then you see this provider, and then you see that provider, and then you see this provider, and then you eat lunch, and then you see that provider, and it works out really nice. In the adult world, that isn't how it is. Um, you have to think that you're going to go, you're going to see probably a primary care provider, and then you're going to have to make ensuing appointments. Um, for various and sundry specialists, depending on what you need and how you prioritize uh, the needs that your child has. And so, um, you know, about 50% of my kids with Down syndrome have cardiac issues, but not all of them. And some of them have been released by cardiology because they no longer need to see. So it would be not economical for me to have a cardiologist there all the time because not all my guys need to see see one so um, but but know that this isn't all going to be done in one appointment um, be sure that you understand your adults insurance coverage uh, whether it's private through the parents or Medicare Medicaid whatever you have because um, there are services they will cover and there are services they will not cover and there are services that they will cover only at certain hospitals and services um, I think a lot about sleep studies uh, some of the insurances will cover at one hospital and they won't cover at another be sure that you know who your caseworker is. Um, keep in contact with them as you consider this transition and somebody that you can talk to. Uh, they'll help a, a lot in securing um, some attendance or day services or residential care or whatever you need as you need them. Um, and they can maybe get your name on some um, waiting lists so that if the time comes, you can make a decision about whether or not to do. But you need to know who your caseworker is. Um, if you and them don't jibe, then you've got time to maybe look for another one. If you have any articles, which I'll bet most of you do, about your child's um, disability or care guidelines, take them with you and present them to the provider. Um, you know way more about your child and about whatever your child's experiencing, what syndrome they have, than that provider does most likely. And so um, it doesn't hurt for you to take an article. I have several parents that have brought me articles and, and I have one mom's brought me the same article about three times because uh, <laughs> I assure her every time I read it and then she, she brings it to me again, which is fine um, because I read them every time and uh, helps me understand because he's, it's a very rare syndrome and not something that I can sit down and discuss with another provider because nobody knows about this syndrome. So uh, if you have any articles, and especially ones that say, okay, this is what they need to be screened for, and here are the health problems that they have as adults, um, those are invaluable to a new provider. Um, be patient with the new provider. Um, they're, they're learning as they go, and for, for most of us. Um, I still learn every time a new patient with Down syndrome comes in, but your child is unique, and so we have to learn about them. Uh, if you told me my child has autism, as you well know, there's a whole variety of ways that that comes forth. And so we have to learn what this particular child needs and what his particular need, what he or she's particular needs. And I'm sure you already know the next one is be cautious about websites, Facebook sites, and groups. Um, that suggest new treatments or over-the-counter. What works for one doesn't work for another one. And there are some drugs that, that a provider will um, use off-label 
do you all know what that means, use something off-label? The FDA will approve a drug for a certain use, and if you use it for another use, then that's off-label. And so some providers, will, you'll see a story that some provider gave this person this and it worked miraculously well, it's an off-label drug, and I may not be comfortable doing that. Um, I found this in particular with CBD oil. When it first came out, everybody wanted to know if I'd prescribe that for their kiddo. And I said, no, I don't know anything about it. The, the websites are a little sketchy. There's no good research. Uh, you'll have to make that decision at home. So um, that happens. Periodically, something will come up, and uh, they'll, they'll want to try it. Um, so when you come to visit me, in particular, um, if you bring me in a sheath of paperwork from um, the day your child was born until currently, I'm, I'm pretty much overwhelmed um, by all of that. And so um, in particular, I like just to see any kind of lab work or office visits you've had within the last year. Um, that prevents me from repeating things. If you just had, if your child just had lab work drawn uh, six months ago, there's really no need for me to repeat that, um, causing undue upset. And, um, and also I worry that insurance might not pay for it if there wasn't a good reason for me to repeat that. And so I like to see any lab work that's been done the last year, any um, provider's visits that he's, he or she's had in the last year, that helps me a lot know where we're going because uh, they usually address um, that this isn't my last visit with this patient and here's what the future looks like and we can make that transition a little bit easier. Um, know what conditions your adult has or has had and what medications they're on. It helps if you know some of them that have been tried um, because periodically I'll say, hey, let's try this and you know, I'll get a print and say, hmm, I think he was on maybe three years ago we tried that and it didn't work. Well, yeah, that doesn't, you know, if you have a list of medications maybe that you've tried in the past, didn't help for whatever conditions we're dealing with, um, that's helpful. Um, something as general as I think he had a heart condition is not particularly helpful. Um, if you can tell me exactly what kind of heart condition he had, that is helpful um, as I make uh, referrals. So um, if you... Generally, if you have electronic medical records and you can obtain them, they have a problem list and that'll tell us exactly what those problems are. And so that's helpful to bring in. Um, don't assume that every office has access to um, all the medical records just because everybody tells you they have electronic medical records. Um, those, those electronic medical records are not always shared between institutions. There's a few from when I am at KU, there's a few that I can access. Um, but there are a lot I cannot access, and so I don't have your history, and um, I can't look up the meds that they've been on in the past just because there's, um, it's electronic, and um, they'll maybe share with people in their group, like HCA, maybe all the HCA hospitals will share that, but that doesn't mean that I have access to them. Um, also, as you think about guardianship, I'm sure they discussed this this morning, think about progression. Uh, if something happens to you, who's going to take over? And does that person know that they're going to take over? Um, and are they prepared for that? And do they understand what that involves? Um, when I started my clinic, um, this was kind of one of the un, um, unforeseen um, advantages that came out of it is um, I had a, a couple mamas that died kind of, they'd always taken care of their kiddos, and they had brought them to me and I'd seen them for a little while and they um, passed away. And uh, one in particular, I remember uh, his brother brought him in and he said, I'm his guardian and I don't have a clue what's going on. And I said, that's okay, we got it. We've got it. I knew him, you know, before your mom passed away. I know what medical issues we're facing. I know what medications he's on. We're just going to proceed on for here. So that gave some semblance, at least in that part of their lives, that he didn't have to worry about. So um, there's, there's some real advantages. Even though he was guardian, he was willing to do it. He was, he was really floundering for a little while. Um, the, in the, usually in the notes, you need to think about what specialists you need to see um, and, what, um, and what in the future that you'll need to see. 
Um, sometimes uh, a, pedi a pediatric specialist will say, I'm going to see him one more time, and then he doesn't need to be seen for another year, but then you need to transition to an adult provider. And um, then, then we can put that on the list uh, to do in a year, but we don't have to do that today. Um, and you can assist the provider in, dis in establishing what needs to be taken care of today and what you can wait on. Um, do you have an eye doctor? And when was their last exam? And can that wait before we need to write a referral? Do we need to have that done right away? Um, how are his ears? Is, is the person hearing okay? Do we need to get him to an audiologist or an ENT person right away because he's having difficulties? Or can we wait on that for a while? Um, sometimes there are things that need immediate attention. And we need to get them in as soon as we can. Um, and sometimes it can wait. Um, you can also ask for recommendations for specialists from that primary care provider. Sometimes within the system, uh, they have, I have a, a network of folks that I like to refer to because I know that they treat my guys with special needs um, with some, um, they, they treat them nicely and maturely and they don't, um, they treat the parents nice and I like to use them in their understanding about special needs. Um, there are some that I won't refer to because I don't think they do a good job. And so, and sometimes um, parents come to me with a, a, maybe a cardiologist out in the community that they've been rec recommended to or that they've gone to and they would like to have their child uh, referred out there and that's fine. Um, so if you have somebody you like, um, be cer certainly be open to telling your provider that this is who you'd like to be referred to, um, or um, be open to who they have in their network. Um, another difference in the adult world is that as much as possible, um, I like to talk to your kid. Um, sometimes I know that um, they don't understand, but I talk to them nonetheless. Um, sometimes I don't understand them, and you all can. And so um, sometimes I ask them and they answer, and then I have to have a parent kind of translate for me um, to, to figure out what they're saying. Um, and you can always input as necessary, but as much as possible, let your, if your child's verbal, let your child answer the questions. Um, this is an important step in becoming an adult, is being able to communicate with a provider and tell them what's hurting and, or what's not hurting or how they're feeling. Um, when I first see, um, see a patient, I ask a lot of odd questions. Um, and the medical students always look at me like, really? Um, like, what's your favorite movie? And what's your favorite TV show? And not only does that build rapport with them, and that gives me something to talk to them about, but I also can tell about what, what their cognitive function is. Um, you know, if, if their favorite TV show is SpongeBob SquarePants, that tells me one thing, but if their favorite TV show is, I had one little girl whose favorite TV show was NCIS. She liked Leroy. And uh, then that gave me, she was able to follow the plot and the characters, and that gave me a, a, an idea about what her cognitive functioning was. But it also gave me a chance to talk to her. I had one little guy that knew all the Disney songs and so, and all the Disney movies. So we sat and sang a few that I knew, um, at least the choruses. <laughs> so, um, and once in a while, one, one guy just loved Elvis, and so, I pulled Elvis up on YouTube and we listened to, I don't know, what was Jailhouse Rock or something, I don't know. Uh, but we had a good time. But that gives me some ability to, to talk with them um, about it. So, but let them answer as much as they can and then you fill in. In the pediatric world, it's pretty much your responsibility to answer all the questions and that's a change over in the adult world. Um, then usually at the end of that conversation, then I, look at my adult and I say, now I need to ask, ask your folks some questions, is that okay? And then I can turn to you and ask, is there anything else you'd like to add or anything you'd like to disagree with or whatever? And so um, you get to say your part, um, but I like to talk to the adult if at all possible. Um, again, you won't have specialists at those appointments, those will have to be scheduled separately. Um, there are some concerns 
that will be phased out um, and some new concerns that will be phased in. So, um, you know, we don't have to worry about breast cancer in kids, but we have to worry about it in adult women. Um, we don't have to, so there's some things in Down syndrome, our, our kids are more at risk for leukemia as adults, not so much. So that phases out. So uh, we'll have to decide on what concerns and what, what tests we need to do. I think that um, all providers may not be well versed in, in your, uh, your particular issues and, and your kiddo's uh, particular uh, syndrome, but in general, they try hard to provide the very best care they can. I don't take care of all the kids with Down syndrome in my clinic. I try, <laughs> but I don't take care of all them. But um, I, the providers that have a, a, a patient with Down syndrome uh, will talk to me periodically and say, you know, should I be screening for something that I'm, you know, should I, is this usual or what should I do with this kid? And so um, they're, they're trying to give the very best care they can, and I think that's pretty consistent. Um, if you live a distance from somebody that, um, that you've selected um, to take care of your child, there's, there's no rule saying that you can't have a primary care maybe in your town that takes care of coughs and colds and, you know, those, those kind of things that come up, ear infections and those kind of things that come up um, in the course and not have to drive an hour and a half to come into Kansas City to see somebody. Um, and so you can use a specialty clinic if you can find one um, on an annual basis and just pop in every, you know, once or twice a year and then use, use a local um, primary care uh, provider that would give you um, some of those urgent care kind of things that you need. If your if you're, uh, if you're adult has a hard time with change or has a hard time with um, office visits, um, a little bit of sedation works really wonderfully. Um, we, can, we can give them a little bit of sedation so that they're calmer, so we can get through the blood draw if that's particularly stressful. Um, if it's particularly stressful when they're, they're coming into a new provider, um, if that's a problem, we can talk about that. Um, and so uh, just know that there's that option available if, you're, if your child needs that. Um, there's many procedures that we can do um, under sedation if your child has trouble, like with MRIs or CT scans. Um, a lot of hospitals can provide sedation for that and anesthesia so that they can get through that. We have a clinic at KU um, that is, I call it the sedation clinic, I don't know what it's called, but it's done down in pre-op and anesthesia gives them uh, this uh, hot pink liquid. And someday I'm gonna take some home with me um, <laughs> because the kids drink it and then they don't care. <laughs> they just don't care. I had, I had one guy with autism and he was probably six, five maybe, weighed over 300 pounds, big, big boy, did not like needles. And I wasn't about to go at him with a needle because I would have ended up in next Tuesday. Um, and so they gave him a little drink of the, the hot pink stuff and, and <laughs> we said, we're gonna draw your blood and he went like this. <laughs> and that was the whole reaction we got from him, right? Was like, we said, okay, we gave him, he hadn't had any immunization since he was 12, and he was like 30 something. And we started up here and we worked our way down and we gave him every immunization we could think of and we drew blood and he just didn't care. And so, <laughs> um, so and, then, and then they kind of kept him until he was good and awake and then they sent him home. And it worked out really, it works out really, really well. Um, the, probably one of the bigger sticking points is finding dental care that will provide sedation. There's a couple here in town that will do um, sedated uh, dental care, but um, they're kind of hard to find. But, um, uh, but it is possible, so if your child needs dental care but needs sedation to do it, um, we can always refer you to those couple that are around. Um, I think more than anything, we want this to be a positive experience. You know, I understand um, that this is a stressful experience, going from somebody that's taken care of you and your child since they were born for 18 years or 20 years, and now you have to change. I understand that's stressful. Somebody you've had confidence in for all those years and you've called 
um, with every problem and they've been able to work through it with you and now you have to change. But I think it's just as stressful for your child uh, to go to a new office and see somebody else that's new and wonder if they're going to take good care of them and they're unfamiliar and the surroundings are unfamiliar. And it's, we want to understand that it's very stressful. Um, so prepare your child as best you can. Um, things like you know, showing them pictures of where you're going, um, maybe walking through before the day of the appointment, not stop anywhere, just walking around and you know, seeing where the parking is and you know, what, what goes on in the lobby and all that sort of thing is, can be helpful as well. Um, I put a couple pictures up. I'm terrible at Facebook. I'm just terrible at it. I, I, but I put up pictures of the clinic and, and of me so that they recognize, maybe you, know, you can go over that and they recognize my face when they come in to help, help with that. But those are the kind of things you can just walk around if, you, if your kiddo is in particular stressed with this new environment. So those are kind of my thoughts. Um, and uh, we, we do want to take good care of, of your child. And we, uh, it's not always easy. And we always keep in mind that you know your child better than anybody else in this entire world. And that you want the best for that child. And that's what we want. And so we try to make this transition as easy as can be. It's, it's a difficult process, but we try to make it as easy as can be. And know that we will work with you and we will try our very best to provide good care to you and your family and do what's right. So if there's any questions, um, there's my contact information if, if you need that. Um, are there any questions that I can answer? Okay, thank you very much.